Bannon's new book, Fire and Fury. In it, former chief strategist Steve Bannon slams that 2016 Trump Tower meeting with Russians as treasonous, while other aides paint the White House as chaotic and ineffective. Last night and this morning, Steve Bannon seemed to backtrack on his criticism. Here's President Trump. Did Steve Bannon betray you, Mr. President? Thank you very Any much. words about Steve Bannon? I don't know. He called me a great man last night, so you know he obviously changed his tune pretty quick. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. I don't talk to him. I don't talk. I don't talk to him. That's just a misnomer. An important day to get word from the White House. That guest coming up in a moment. But let's first go to White House correspondent Kevin Cork joining us live from the briefing room, which will be a hot spot in about 25 minutes. Yeah, you're right on the money. Bottom of the hour, we're expecting Sarah Sanders to come out here once again address reporters. Although, if you know anything about covering the White House, it probably won't happen at the bottom of the hour. But we'll be here nonetheless whenever she steps up here to uh, address reporters. But you're right. Very interesting. I think I should point this out, Harris. Uh, the president's lawyers are pushing back very forcefully. It may, look, Flory's outside, but a flurry of letters uh, going from his lawyer's offices today, not just uh, to Steve Bannon, but also in particular to the publisher of the book fire and fury the president saying listen uh, you can't keep putting out false information it could lead to uh, libel per se uh, false statements and other mischaracterizations now that said we'll tell you more about that throughout the day but let me share just some of the excerpts from the book and trust me there have been some pretty explosive ones a number of them do circulate the idea that Steve Bannon thought that he was the guy in charge I just want to share a couple with you I think the folks at home will find it pretty interesting uh, Bannon apparently believed he was running the show and also believed that the president's daughter, Ivanka, would at one point bring down her father. Wow. Uh, the president uh, in this book apparently appointed the chief of staff, John Kelly, without even telling him about the job first. And the author also questioned the president's ability to function on the job. And that's sort of a narrative that you've seen played out there on other networks uh, since the very beginning of his administration. Now, by the way, all this is happening, uh, Harris, as the president's lawyers are sending another cease and desist letter, this time to his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. This one accuses him of repeated violations of the terms of his separation, including comments attributed to him in that forthcoming book. Uh, by the way, those comments drew this response from the president himself. Steve, talking about Mr. Bannon, was rarely in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me and only pretends to have had influence to fool a few people with no access and no clue whom he helped write phony books. Now, for his part, Bannon seems to be backing up just a bit. Despite the big controversy, he says he is committed to the Trump agenda. Don't worry, there will be no uh, daylight between the agenda, Donald Trump, and the uh, folks at Breitbart, and the, the show, and the website. The President of the United States is a great man. You know I support him day in and day out, whether going through the country, giving the Trump miracle speech, or on the show, or on the website. So I don't think you have to worry about that. Now, as you can well imagine, there are a number of excerpts from this book that continue to generate a great deal of excitement among some who particularly might not like the president. And others are just wondering about the veracity of the claims. And yet they're out there, and so we'll be talking about them at length here today, Harris. And I'm certain that when Sarah Sanders comes out, it'll probably be the very first question she gets. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you, Kevin. Questions mm -hmm. are now being raised, important ones, about author Michael Wolf and Steve Bannon's credibility. This after Steve Bannon's criticism of that 2016 Trump Tower meeting appeared to contradict what he said about Russian collusion allegations last fall. There's nothing to the Russia investigation. It's a waste of time. What do you believe? You know what the National Security Institution believe. What do you believe? What do you mean what they believe? We, we don't really, I mean, that there may have been, I, I think, what, look, I was no, there. No, 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 it's a total you, and complete farce. Russian collusion is a farce. Okay. So that's a total and complete shift from what apparently he told Michael Wolf. But you know what? Michael Wolff has reportedly had his own issues with the truth, even admitting in one of his books that he can be, and I'm quoting him here, unreliable. Joining us now, Deputy White House Press Secretary Hogan Gidley. An important day to get you on board, not just for this, but some other issues coming up uh, as well, Hogan. But first of all, with all of this, you've seen a, a kind of a buildup from response in the White House. Where are you now? Look, I think you outlined some of those things very well, uh, Harris. I mean, this writer, uh, by his own admission, and quite frankly, his reputation is one of a crackpot fake news fiction writer. You don't have to look too far. The people quoted in the book, many of them have already come out on the record and said, 
you lied. I never said those things. So it's pretty obvious that this book is filled with falsehoods and out and out lies. The president called them out. He's never been one to shy, shy away from a, from a fight. And this is obviously a hit job on the president, but one that is filled with lies. And we believe that the future will prove uh, our side of that case. So Hogan, about an hour and a half ago, the president got on board with and got on the record with, look, I saw that Steve Bannon changed his tune last night pretty quickly. I don't talk to him. Uh, where are we? Is there is there some some sort of a break with Steve Bannon? He did play a role, uh, and and what does that look like? Well, let, let's talk about the role. I mean, there's no doubt he was shortly, uh, briefly on the campaign, but he wasn't on the ballot. The people didn't vote for Steve mm. Bannon. I believe that he over-exaggerated his role on the campaign, not to mention here in the White House. The people voted for the president because he outlined a vision for the future that would come to Washington, drain the swamp, take it over, put things uh, in perspective as it relates to the American people, give a voice to the folks who've been forgotten across this country. That's what won in the election. And you've seen the results. Let's not forget, in the face of unprecedented Unprecedented negative news. Ninety percent of the stories against this president are, are, are negative, and uh, all the incoming we see uh, predominantly is about palace intrigue. But in the face of all that, this president has still come to a town that doesn't budge and moved it mightily by his own hand, gotten tax reform for middle class, crushed ISIS, uh, spawned on an incredible economic growth for the first time in 30 years, tax cuts for the middle class, tax reform. Uh, we're talking about immigration moving into the new year, the first time in 30 years that's even uh, mm -hmm. uh, come up. So these are the types of things he's done without and in quite, uh, quite frankly, despite Steve Bannon in many cases. All right, Hogan, last question on this, because you see that the new push from the White House now is to try to sue to get this book blocked. Do you think that can get done with the White House attorneys? Look, I don't want to weigh into uh, to any legal battle. I mean, I'll leave that to the attorneys. But the fact remains, so much of this book is, is out and out lies. And I, I mentioned some of the folks inside there. I mean, people like Katie Walsh, people like Sean Spicer, Mick Mulvaney have all come out and said, that's absolutely false. He never said those, or I never said those things. And so this is something that the attorneys have uh, in their quiver, I'm sure, and they'll use it. But I'm no attorney, so I'm going to leave that to them. All right. So that's it on the book. I want to talk a little bit, though, about the president and where his focus is today. Uh, you mentioned immigration. We've got the meeting with GOP senators coming over to talk about that. Break that meeting down for me and, and what you think going forward will look like. January 19th is a heartbeat away. So with spending, we got to talk about these things. Absolutely. These are the tough issues that the president would not shy away from. Bureaucrats have got us in this position, uh, doing nothing for the better part of 30 years. The president's here in just a year, and I've mentioned all the things he's done so far. But this is another one that's important for him to try and tackle. But let's be honest. Any conversation about DACA, the president has been clear that it must be tethered to ending chain migration, ending the visa lottery, border enforcement with some type of wall, and also uh, making sure that interior enforcement, that we give the folks along the border everything they need to make sure sure that uh, immigrants uh, illegal uh, with nefarious uh, ideas and, and, and goals don't come into this country. All right. I want our viewers to know uh, that's coming up at 215 Eastern, the president meeting with Republican members of the Senate about 2018 legislative priorities. Additionally, uh, and I understand that the vice president will will be there for that. So you've had a couple of talks today, one on immigration and then on what things will look like ahead. An important day to have you aboard, though, with all the news that is breaking about that book, and I'm glad to get your perspective on it. Hogan, thank you very much. We'll bring you back. Thanks, Harris. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Well, let's bring in the anchor of Fox News Sunday, Chris Wallace. Uh, Chris, I caught a bit of news there uh, from Hogan talking about, you know, a reminder that Steve Bannon was not on the ballot. Is, does that create enough separation for this White House with this book? Listen, I am very fond of Hogan Gidley. I've known him for years, uh, but he was spinning like crazy today. L let's review. <laughs> Clearly, of course, Steve Bannon was not on the ballot, but he was the chairman of the campaign in the crucial months of the general election. In addition, he sort of talks about him as some aide in the White House. He was the chief strategist. President Trump announced that Reince Priebus would be the chief of staff and Steve Bannon would be the chief strategist and that they together would in effect run the White House staff very early in the transition. He was a major, major player. Now I can understand why the president and the people around him don't like what Steve Bannon is saying now, but you can't uh, walk away from the fact that he was a key player in the final crucial months of the campaign and a very key player, uh, strategic player, in the early months, basically the first six months or so, 
of the Trump presidency. So I would say Hogan Gidley didn't actually say that he was a minor player. He just said he wasn't on the ballot. But what you're talking about is what Michael Wolff has in his book. And I do want to ask you, though, about Michael Wolff's reputation and where we stand. I mean, if, you, if you're hearing inside the Beltway that they could actually get this book blocked, if there's some sort of non-disclosure, I mean, Hogan couldn't speak to the legal issues. He didn't want to step on that case. But, but what are you learning about this? Is there some sort of non-disclosure agreement that could say, well, look, you can publish, but you can't put this in it? No. I mean, there's any non-disclosure agreement would be between Steve Bannon and the Trump organization. I wonder whether there's a non-disclosure agreement once uh, he was no longer working for the Trump campaign, but was working instead for the United States government as an employee. I don't think there's such a thing as a non-disclosure agreement with a U.S. official, which is what Steve Bannon was as the chief strategist in the White House. Now, he might have a cause of action, as I say, against Bannon. You're a lawyer. I'm not. I don't see how he could have a cause of action against Michael Wolff. Uh, and, and, you know, there's another point that needs to be brought out there. I was talking to a former senior administration official, White House official. Mm -hmm. uh, he he had, uh, Michael Wolf did, almost free access in the White House. He was repeatedly invited in. The communications team in the White House urged all of the senior advisors to cooperate. This, they thought that this was going to be a positive book for the president. Uh, and you, you can argue whether or not it's accurate or not and whether the quotes exist or not. We'll find out about that. Michael Wolf says he has tapes of a lot of the key interviews sure. he did. But the fact that he was in the White House, this is with the approval of the president and his communications team. You know, um Outside of what we know that Steve Bannon, because he hasn't refuted what he said about Don, uh, Donald Trump Jr. and the, and the meetings uh, that had to do with Russian officials uh, at, the, at the Trump Tower, but outside of that, is there anything that is problematic that you see for this White House? Because, you know, we've heard a lot of the gossip and the palace intrigue about how people did and didn't get along. I mean, outside of that element of it, isn't it just another book? How do you see it? Well, we don't, first of all, we don't know, because you haven't seen the book, my guess is, and I know I haven't seen the book, and so we've only you know, read about a sliver uh, of excerpts from the book. In terms of what we have read about, though, you do have Steve Bannon, as you said, suggesting that the meeting that Donald uh, Jr. and Jared Kushner attended with that Russian lawyer in June of 2016 was uh, treasonous. Uh, he also says he thinks there's zero chance uh, that, uh, that those folks, Don Jr. in particular, didn't walk the Russian lawyer up to meet the president. And he also talks about the possibility that, that there was money laundering going on with Deutsche Bank, which may be how the whole issue of Russian collusion plays out. So, I, you know, look, the fact that Steve Bannon says this doesn't mean it's necessarily true or it's evidence, but it certainly adds fuel to the fire of the special counsel's investigation. Yeah, it's a lot for the publisher to try to figure out. Uh, between now and the release, I would imagine that the onus is always on that editor to try to, to, to shore up those facts. I mean, for those of us who've written books, we know that that's the case. Uh, but in the meantime, the president is talking today about immigration. And before I let you go, uh, he's getting a fast start on his legislative agenda. What do you see kind of coming down the pike ahead of January 19th? Well, let me just say one thing about the book. They're not trying to sort out fact from fiction. This book is already in print. It's already at bookstores. So uh, the legal vetting has already gone on. And one assumes that they felt confident enough to come out with a book. Uh, so, so that part of it, I suspect, uh, mm. you know, I'd be very surprised if they're able to stop the book or that it's, uh, it's uh, withdrawn voluntarily yeah. by Henry Hall Publishers. As far as the agenda, getting back to issues that really affect people's lives, Amen. Uh, it, look, the big issue, and we had that meeting between the big four, the two Democratic leaders, House Senate, two Republican leaders, is, is January 19th and the government funding. And, and the fact is that an awful lot of things that uh, Democrats want to attach to it, in effect saying we're not going to get a spending deal unless we get a DACA deal. The right. Republicans are saying absolutely not. They're separate. There's a separate deadline. The DACA uh, doesn't run out until March. But Democrats are coming under real pressure from uh, a lot of their base, especially obviously Hispanics and pro-immigration people saying you need to take care of this now well, while you have promised. some leverage over the White House. The, the Democrats promised that they would do the job that, that the Dreamers are holding them accountable for and then you saw so much anger at the end of 2017 because the spending resolution uh, that got us to January 19th didn't have DACA in it. I mean, 
there are a lot of people who are holding the Democrats accountable. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, Chris Wallace, I know what I will be doing this Sunday, watching Fox News Sunday. Check your listings, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, Harris. Former Trump campaign chair Paul Manafort is suing special counsel Robert Mueller and the Justice Department. He claims Mueller exceeded his mandate on the Russia investigation. We know it's gone far afield. So could this be part of a legal strategy that pays off for his defense? And the Trump bump hits a milestone. Take a look at that. The Dow reaching an all-time high today, and it is hovering still across that 25,000 mark for the first time in American history. President Trump tweeted this, Dow just crashed through 25,000, congrats, big cuts and unnecessary regulations continuing. And you know what I say? Stay close. alert on a massive snowstorm pummeling the east coast much of it playing out over my left shoulder here uh it's gained strength as it's moved out north areas in the northeast now doing what they can to brace for blizzard-like conditions and what's being called a bomb cyclone or bomb genesis boston is expecting to get 18 inches of snow and that's where we find brian Yanis. wow so that just left here and it's moved into your territory brian <laughs> That's exactly right, Harris. You know, they're expecting about 12 inches here to 18 inches of snow in the Boston area. But the big concern right now is coastal flooding and power outages. We just had high tide at about 1230. It is still continuing. And we're talking about two to three feet of snow along the coast. This is a photo actually taken here uh, in Boston at the Commercial Wharf. This is a restaurant there. Uh, this was taken by someone on Twitter. You can see the water has come in with that storm surge because of what happened with the, with high tide and you can also see the chunks of ice that are in that water that is also a concern that ice has been moving in because it has been so cold here that can act as shrapnel when it comes to power outages there's about 4200 people without power in massachusetts the concern is wet snow freezing rain and you've got high winds 50 60 maybe even 70 mile an hour gusts along the cape that can cause those power outages all along the nantucket uh, situate Plymouth and those areas. The governor spoke earlier today and he said it's really about New Englanders here taking care of one another. He also uh, reiterated that people should take care of their heating vents at their homes. Take care of your homes inside and out. Clear out exhaust vents. Make sure carbon monoxide detectors and smoke alarms are working. Shovel out your driveways and sidewalks and be mindful of frozen pipes. After the storm, Arctic blast, the wind chill here could reach minus 20 in parts for the next two days. Harris? Whew. All right. Brian, thank you very much. Former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort is suing the Justice Department and special counsel Robert Mueller. He claims Mueller exceeded his mandate by investigating matters unrelated to the 2016 election. Both Manafort and his business associate face money laundering and other charges as part of the special counsel's Russia investigation. Let's bring in Robert Driscoll, former deputy assistant attorney general. So we knew that they had gone far afield. And we also know that, you know what, that's what investigators sometimes do. Can he win? No, I mean, I, I don't think that he can win the, the underlying lawsuit, but that doesn't mean the, the lawsuit's not a, not a good idea or a strategy on the part of the defense team. Um, because he, even if he did win, I think some other component of the DOJ could bring the same indictment. And frankly, the, the special counsel regulations that he's attacking uh, are much narrower than uh, the independent counsel statute, which was allowed to expire, which had some constitutional concerns raised about it. But I think it's a, it's a pretty savvy move in that uh, it's got this narrative in the news that, that Mueller overreached and that he went back and served 100 subpoenas about uh, matters that, that all predated the Trump campaign. And, um, you know, in the underlying case, there's a gag order, which wouldn't allow the defense team to, to put all that out there. And in this case, they can get that out there. So there may be a, a jurisdictional mm. problem with the case. There could be a procedural dismissal. I'm sure lots of smart people would say, you know, the, the case has no chance of succeeding in the long term. Interesting. But uh, by forcing Mueller to uh, defend it, there could be benefit to the defense team. Uh, you know, can anyone rein in Mueller? Should they try? You talk about overreaching. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, the, the way it's supposed to work under the existing regulations is that every expansion um, that Mueller uh, does to the, to the probe is supposed to be uh, signed off by the Deputy Attorney General, uh, Rod Rosenstein. And, um, you know, that, that would be the Deputy Attorney General's job to stop the special counsel if the special counsel was going uh, too far afield. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, Rod has testified, or uh, Deputy Rosenstein has testified, that, you know, he's proved every step of the way what Mueller has done. So and that would be the mechanism to do it. But that's what's being challenged here. And so to the extent uh, this lawsuit can survive procedural challenges, um, you know, maybe the defense can find out exactly how those approvals went down and what evidence was presented and those kind of things which would all be helpful to the Robert, defense. Robert, what are the worst of the charges against Paul Manafort right now? Well, I mean, they're, they're, as he's emphasized, there's nothing related to Trump or the campaign necessarily. Um, but I mean, there's, there's some money laundering charges and some tax charges. You know, Can he go to prison which, for any of that? Oh yeah, for, for sure. Um, because there's a lot of uh, money, and so the, the gain or loss comes a, a factor in terms of sentencing guidelines, uh, and the you know, non-registration under the Foreign Asset uh, Foreign Agent Registration Act, things like that. I mean, certainly you could face uh, significant jail time if convicted on all those will? counts. Um, I, I think he could. I don't know enough about the underlying case. Um, it, certainly, it, it seems like the DOJ came down very hard, the special counsel very hard on Manafort. Uh, people typically aren't. Uh, indicted under the Foreign Assets, a uh, Foreign Agent Registration Act. Uh, that's unusual, and a, a, a lot of it comes down to, I think, technical tax defenses and things like that that probably most people wouldn't understand. But I, I think he's in he's in serious jeopardy based on the indictment. So, what does pressing Manafort tell you about what Robert Mueller might have in terms of collusion with the White House and Russia? Does does it tell us? Does it inform us that that's a strong case or not? Because we don't know exactly what he has, but sometimes you can telegraph out by where people put and and poke right I mean I, I think there could be two two options or, or both options could be could be available one could be that he's obviously trying to roll up uh, Manafort to go after someone else and there's a very small number of people above Manafort on a kind of organizational chart for the campaign uh, another thing you got to remember too is when you compare the Manafort indictment to Flynn um, you know, Special Counsel Mueller is sending a message that if you cooperate, you're going to get treated a lot better than if you don't cooperate. And Manafort thus far has not cooperated, and he ended up with a, an indictment where the Special Counsel brought the kitchen sink, and, um, you know, General Flynn, uh, you know, did a plea, plea bargain to one count, mm -hmm. which likely won't result in jail time at all. So I think that's also a message that Special Counsel is sending to other potential witnesses or other folks he may be negotiating with to say, hey, if you play ball with me, I can make your life a lot easier, and if you don't, I can make your life very difficult. Uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that you let this play out with Mueller, uh, and then if he finds that there is no evidence, because so far he's not found any of collusion with the White House and Russia, you move on from this pretty quickly. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any real benefit um, uh, to attacking Mueller to, to, or trying to derail him now for, for the White House. I think that, you know, from what's publicly available, and again, we don't know what, what Mueller has, uh, right now, there are some folks that are collateral to the campaign that, that got into some trouble with some lobbying and tax issues that are essentially unrelated to the campaign and really them um, arguably trying to take advantage of access to the campaign. Uh, but there's nothing uh, that, that goes to the president or, or goes to any of the collusion that has been typically discussed uh, kind of in the media. So I think from the president's team, you, you sit back, you hope this goes as quickly as it can, you try to move it along, set expectations that it'll end soon, and, and wait for... Uh, for things to clear. And if it ended up being that, that Manafort and Flynn indictments are the end of the road, mm -hmm. I think that would end up being a win for, for the president. Former Deputy Attorney General Robert Driscoll, thank you very much for your expertise. Thank you. What will be the fallout from the new explosive White House tell-all? Remember, we had a member of the White House team on just a few minutes ago. And what it all might mean for the president's core supporters is some candidates are backing away from Steve Bannon starting to distance themselves from the former strategist. We're awaiting also to hear more from the White House briefing, which starts a short time from now. Here's Sarah Sanders yesterday on the president's supporters. The president's base is very solid. Uh, it hasn't changed because the president hasn't changed and his agenda hasn't changed. As we await the start of the White House press briefing, the Trump-Bannon feud raising some big questions about what this could mean for the president's base. But White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders has already insisted nothing has changed. 
I don't think it does anything to the president's base. The, the, the base and the people that supported this president supported the president and supported his agenda. Those things haven't changed. The president's still exactly who he was uh, yesterday as he was two years ago when he started out on the campaign trail. His agenda hasn't changed, and he's continuing to fight for and push for that agenda. And I think the base is extremely excited and happy with the job that this president has done in his first year in office. Look at all he's accomplished. I think they're pretty happy with where he is. Fallout from Bannon's uh, so-called blistering remarks about the president and his family also putting pressure on candidates he has already backed, with at least four already distancing themselves from Steve Bannon. For more reaction, we're joined by RNC spokesperson Kaylee McEnany. And Kaylee, first of all, I mean, we saw a flurry of responses from the White House to the press secretary to the comms director for the first lady from also the RNC. Why from the RNC? Because it's important to stand behind this president. He is the leader of our party. We stand in lockstep with him. And we wanted to make clear that there's one person who speaks to the Republican base, one alone, not Steve Bannon. It is President Trump, the man who won Pennsylvania and Michigan states Republicans haven't won since the 80s, the man who won more GOP primary votes than any primary candidate in the history of our party, and the man who won 304 electoral votes. That was Donald Trump. We stand beside him, and especially at a time like this. You know, some of the uh, more incendiary remarks uh, said to be from Steve Bannon in this book were comments about the Donald Trump Jr. meeting with Russian officials at Trump Tower, calling them treasonous. Now, we've seen Steve Bannon kind of walk his rhetoric back, but we haven't seen him refute any of that, which means potentially he really said it. How problematic is that for the White House? It's not problematic because, look, President Trump, I, I would note that in the lawsuit against Bannon, he's also being sued for disparaging statements and at times defamatory statements. Which of the Bannon statements are true and not true, you know, that's for a legal team to sort out. But what I would say with regard to that statement in particular, the Don Jr. meeting, it was not treasonous at all. This was a par for the course meeting to get opposition research. Hillary Clinton had had similar meetings like this with foreign, foreign agents, foreign powers. I believe it was the Ukrainian if I'm not mistaken. So there have been similar examples of this with other campaigns. It was a par for, par for the course meeting. Nothing turned up. And if Bannon ca categorized it that way, completely off base. Why is Bannon such a loose cannon? Sorry for the rhyme. It's a great question because, look, he was someone who was standing behind this conservative populist movement that the president created. But, you know, it's unfortunate, but that's why we take our guiding steps from the leader of our party. That's President mm -hmm. Trump. No one else. RNC, fundraising arm of the party, and when you look at something like this, you have people talking about division within the party, and that's never good. Uh, what is your take on how things are really kind of fanning out in, in the White House? Because this book says it's chaotic. It's not chaotic at all, and I think all you have to do is look at the president's record of successes, um, confirming more circuit court judges than any president in modern history, tax cuts that we haven't seen in three decades, record-setting regulations being withdrawn and removed. There's a record pace here of achievements. So if it's as chaotic as the media wants you to believe, uh, he wouldn't be getting all that done. And uh, one more thing I want to point out to you, Harris, mm -hmm. you know, this is the same 2016 playbook that we're seeing play out again in this book, this idea that I'm going to mischaracterize the president and his family members and drag them through the mud because they're achieving too much. I saw it all throughout 2016, this effort to define and demonize the president. This book is another, another iteration. It's the 2018 iteration. All right, before I let you go, let's make it about Steve Bannon. I mean, you've got some of these candidates now for 2018 who are saying, wait a minute, maybe I better take another look. If he's on my side, if he's somebody that I wanted to help, what is his role in the party? Well, it's a fair question. These candidates are standing, and I'm encouraged to see the four that have come out, they're standing by the president. And if that means backing away from Steve Bannon, that's what has to be done. Standing by the president's the name of the game. We encourage every candidate to make the decision right for their campaign, and that decision is standing by the president. And, and so what do you do with Steve Bannon? Well, we hope that he's come around, as the president pointed out. He today said President Trump's a great man, so we hope that <laughs> Steve Bannon that. continues to, to say the truth, which is this is, I think, I'm going to uh, quote Orrin Hatch here, probably the greatest president Orrin Hatch has ever served under, if not the greatest of our time. All right. Kaylee McEnany from the RNC, spokesperson, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Harris. President Trump has taken a lot of criticism for his tweets on North Korea. But with North Korea now talking to the South, for the first time in nearly two years, does the president deserve some credit for moving the ball forward?
the fact that we have China working with us on sanctions against North Korea. A year ago, nobody thought that was possible. So you may not like the tactics, but the actions and, and what it, those tactics are producing, and we got to say it's, it's been successful. We come in with this Fox News alert. President Trump has agreed to delay joint military drills between the United States and South Korea until after next month's Winter Olympics. That decision comes after North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un reopened cross-border communications with South Korea for the first time in nearly two years. The president taking credit for that development, tweeting, with all of the failed experts weighing in, does anybody really believe that talks and dialogue would be going on between North and South Korea right now if I wasn't firm, strong, and willing to commit our total might against the North? Fools. But talks are a good thing. Let's bring in Republican Congressman Duncan Hunter of California. He's a member of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, good to have you, Congressman, along today to, to break out this development. How much is the president right about taking credit, and why do you think he doesn't normally get it on this issue? N number one, he is totally right. It's, it's not about his tweets. It's about the military might and the way that he's presented what America will do to support our, our allies in the region and that we are willing to go to war with North Korea. I think he's made that very, very pure and simple. And number two, the reason he doesn't uh, get the accolades is because people don't like him. It, it, and by people, I would say the media, the people that give the accolades are the uh, the liberal press and and the liberal press doesn't like trump so therefore he's not going to get any any credit for this but he's doing the right thing and I'll, t I'll tell you what 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 trump needs to do this year what i would love to see the president do is say no more north korea launches period we're going to make it a no missile area we're, we're going to shoot down every single rocket that you launch up in the air we're going to shoot it down before it even gets into space, and we ha we have to use all, all of our complex uh, ballistic missile interceptor stuff, mm -hmm. we're going to shoot them down over Kim Jong Un's head. That that would be a, a great 2018 for me, as if Trump could finally shut North Korea down and make it an, a no-fly zone, basically, for intercontinental ballistic missiles. And can he do that by next week? Because you know can, the, the reports now. are that the that we may see another missile test. We don't even know what that's going to look like yet. We don't know the payload on that missile and other details. So Harris, here's 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 what's easy about it. North Korea is only about 150 miles wide. I'm 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 on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee on the Armed Services Committee. You could have F-35s up ringing North Korea right now, shooting down any launch that they make with. Uh, uh, air-to-air -air interceptor missile called the AMRAAM. That is, okay. that is doable right now, actually, so yes. Well, that's some great detail to have. The Strategic Forces Subcommittee, I would imagine, is also talking about uh, Guam and those areas that are close in. Talk to me about where you apply pressure now uh, from, from the president, because you know he's taken a lot of heat on that one tweet where he said that he had a bigger nuclear button than Kim Jong-un. Yeah, that was probably a silly tweet. I think that that, that detracts from what he's he's been doing here. The the only thing that we can do more is get China to be on our side. Uh, we've been trying to do that for you know they're decades selling them oil, when it comes to right? North Korea. Yep, yep, they're selling them oil. Sanctions don't 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 work if the biggest nation in that area is unsanctioning North Korea while we're trying to sanction them. You have to keep applying military pressure. And lastly make it a no missile area say if you're going to launch missiles we're going to shoot them down over your your head you're not going to get any practice you, it's not going to help you it, it's not even going to help you when you fail because we're not even going to let you fail we're going to shoot them down over your head that that would be the right choice here in in my opinion i, I don't think that that's an act of of war saying that we're not going to let you practice shooting oh, nuclear missiles at the U united states we're going to shoot them down we're not shooting you but we are going to shoot them if, right. if they go up and they're anywhere near our, our allies or us. You know, that's an interesting point to make, because when the president tweets, critics among Democrats especially say, hey, you're getting you're committing us to nuclear war. But what you're saying is he might want to tweet what you just said. Right. And and, and lastly, Harris, too, the, the uh, funny thing with this is if we don't shut down their nuclear program, we are mm -hmm. going to a mutually assured destruction type foreign policy with them. Because that, that's the only thing you can do if somebody if if North Korea gets 50 intercontinental ballistic missiles, we, we can't shoot 50 down. That's why we have mutually assured destruction with with a country like uh, Russia. Right? right. If they were to do a nuclear attack on us, the only way to stop them from doing from becoming nuclear and getting into that situation is stopping them now. Period. There, there is no going forward after, after they have decoys on, on, on their missiles 
and they get scores of missiles, we're not able to take those down. So stop them now, stop them this year, and make it so that my kids don't have to listen to stories about a nuclear North Korea over the next decade. You know, I want to let our audience know, in case they don't know this, you served three combat tours overseas, two in Iraq and Afghanistan. So when you talk about kind of preempting a war, is what I hear you saying, yeah. uh, you come at it from that kind of experience. I want to give you the last word on this point. How significant is it that the North and South are going to talk? It's Maybe. huge. Uh, in, in Trump words, it's huge. Uh, it's a really big deal. And, and any talking is better than no talking whatsoever. And anything that will, that will 